Hi everybody, this is Arkady Freckman, a New York City personal injury trial attorney. And welcome to last week tonight, where we answer your questions and we talk about your comments. So I think we're about two or three weeks behind, so I'm gonna to try to catch up. And then we may do a live either this week or next week. I was away for a bit, I was doing some skiing out west, and I just got back actually, we had to take the red eye flight. I got back yesterday in the early morning, so I was a little bit groggy, but today, had a good night's sleep, I'm finally back into it. So let's see what questions we have. We had a really good question here from somebody named Mando. And I think was he was asking, or he or she was asking, what is your opinion of a general law firm, like Jacoby and Myers, like a big law firm? And I think what I told him, uh, what I said was that it really depends on the specific lawyer that you draw. Because with the big firms like Jacoby and Myers, there's a lot of firms that maybe have, you know, hundreds or even thousands of lawyers. So it really depends who your particular lawyer is. It's a little bit of luck. If you get a good lawyer, you know, you could do great. Um, and if you, unfortunately, if you get somebody who maybe, you know, doesn't care that much or just is overwhelmed, then you could maybe run into some trouble. And then the person also asked if you could make a video on this topic to go more in depth. And he said, do defense attorneys really take cases to trial if their defendant is 100% at fault and liable, and it's proven and known before trial, or do they try to settle those cases before trial, like mediation or something, since they know it's a for sure loss in front of a jury, or am I wrong? Well, you know, I think what the person is doing here is they're confusing the issue of liability with the issue of damages, right? Because they, the defendants can admit liability, but still do a trial on the issue of damages because they could think, look, we'll admit fault. We were at fault for a car crash or whatever the incident was, but we could beat you on the issue of damages because you are saying the case is worth a million dollars, but we think it's not worth that much. We think it's worth like $10,000, right? So there's a huge difference. So they can take it to trial on the issue of damages. And that's exactly what happened to us actually a few weeks ago where we were prepared to try liability. And then while we're picking a jury, the defendant said, you know what, we'll concede liability and just try the case on the issue of damages, which is what we did. And we ended up getting over half a million dollar verdict. So we were, you know, we had to try the case to get that though, because otherwise the offer would have been, you know, maybe like less than a hundred thousand if we, if we didn't take it to trial. So yeah, so, so that, that pretty much answers the question. You do have to still try it, even if they concede liability. So that's a good question. And then let's see what else we have. Here's a question. Um, I think it's like a workers' comp question. Okay, here's a question from a Nathan Duval Realty three weeks ago. He says, hi, I had an accident with the truck and had surgery on my right shoulder. The truck is, it was the truck's fault, but the truck doesn't have insurance. What can happen in that case? Well, oh, he said it happened actually here in New York in the Bronx. So yeah, what, what happened is if the truck doesn't have any insurance, you could perhaps sue the trucking company if it's a larger company. But if it's a larger company, they should have insurance. But if they don't, you could shoot sue the company and see if you can collect. If they have um, assets, you can collect judgment against the company. The other thing you may be able to do is check into whether there's any other types of insurance. Sometimes there's something known as MSC 90 endorsements. There's broker shipper liability and there's other potential sources of liability, depending on what kind of truck, if it's a tractor trailer. If it's a small uh, truck or like a pickup truck, then that might not come into play. You can also go UM, which is un uninsured or underinsured against your own policy. So for example, if the truck that hit you doesn't have any insurance, but then you have, let's say 100,000, you might be able to go UM and get insurance from your own company, from your own vehicle. Um, so there are other avenues that you can go down. Pretty much it's like checking all the different roads, right? If you can't go th this road because the truck has no insurance, you go down that road and you just check every possible avenue until there's nothing else to check. And hopefully you could find some avenue that leads to some kind of compensation. That's a serious injury with surgery. Okay. 
Then uh, Tomasa says, hi, I really love your videos. Thank you for making helpful content. I have several questions. Can someone get more with severe orthopedic injuries that required surgery? Screws in the ankle, tibia and fibula was broken. Um, arthritis, arthritis in the ankle, bone deformity of the fibula. Also, if SSA says a person is disabled, can someone ask for compensation for this also? Is it possible for a defendant to not want a deposition after receiving video evidence? Any information would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, so I mean, that's a good question. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the fact that someone would have severe orthopedic injuries, including like plates and screws, would make the case worth more. Those cases can be worth a lot. They could be worth hundreds of thousands, if not even millions of dollars. We've had open reduction internal fixation cases with plates and screws go for well over a million dollars. And then the other question about the defendants not wanting a deposition, I think they would probably still want a deposition because remember, it's not the defendants, it's really the attorneys that are hired by the insurance company. They always want a deposition because they want to know how the plaintiff will present themselves, how the plaintiff will answer questions, and then they evaluate the credibility of the plaintiff, whether the plaintiff is likable, and they put that all into their assessment as to how much they think they may be exposed to, right? What's their financial exposure? How much are they gonna to have to pay later on? So they're always looking at their own self-interest in the sense that, are we gonna get hit? Is this, is this going to be a likable person where we can get hit for a lot of money? Or should we offer them a settlement? Should we not offer them a settlement? So they're probably going to want a deposition. Um, yeah. So, but this is a good, this is a good question as well. And then um, there's another question from the same person. Can a case still have a deposition if video evidence is received before the deposition? It proves the defendant account of what happened was totally false. Can the defending lawyer offer to settle without a deposition? I mean, yeah, they could offer to settle without a deposition, especially if it's like a smaller case. I think what she's saying is there's a video that proves the issue of liability, right? Fault. But like we just answered in the prior questions, there's also the issue of damages. So they may still want to depose you on both, on liability and damages. Now, if there is a video and they see the video, um, you know, it just depends. E each case is, is distinct. There's no like rule. I mean, if, if it's really clear, like the defendant is lying, the defendant is saying, hey, you know, whatever, this is what happened. And then the video shows that is not what happened. Like, for example, he's saying your car, you know, backed into him. And then you have the video. No, your car was stopped and he rear ended you. Well, obviously he's lying. So now that entire uh, portion of the deposition maybe is not necessary. But then they're still going to do a deposition as to your medical care, as to how you're feeling, because they could still defend on, on that aspect of it. Okay, let's see what other questions we have. Here's a question from Plebs. He says, after four back surgeries, a shoulder surgery, and five years later, my case is set for trial next month. I really thought my case was going to be settled by now, but the defense sure wants to drag this on. They have admitted liability, the crash is on camera, and they offer double the policy limit, but still not fair value. Could the defense be waiting for the last possible moment before trial to settle? Thank you for your feedback and valuable info. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, they could be waiting. Uh, you know, it's hard to say exactly what they would be doing, but if they admitted liability and the crash is on camera, then obviously, you know, it's not going to be a, qu a question of liability. What they often do is after they admit liability, what they like to do is they, they don't like to admit liability until the last second, right? So they want you to prepare on like liability, get your liability experts. And then when you show up to court and you're like ready to discuss the issue of fault and you have your expert witnesses and you have all your preps and your outlines, then they say, you know what? We're going to admit liability because they, they think that's going to like, you know, mess you up basically, you know, and then that's what happened to us in our last trial. And then, you know, sometimes what they do is they stand up an opening statement and say, look, we're the defendant, we take full responsibility, and we did take full responsibility because we admitted that we were at fault. So now it's just a question of damages. And you can see that they're being greedy, they're asking for millions of dollars, but this case is only really worth like a little bit, like 20,000, you know? So that's what they kind of did to us, or they tried to do to us in the last trial. So there are ways to combat that if that's what they're trying to do. But this sounds like a serious case because like he said, there's four back surgeries, a shoulder surgery, and they've already offered, I think he said, double the policy limit. 
So that's good that they're offering you more than they have. Now, I'm not sure why they're offering so much. Is it because the policy is open? Is it a bad faith case? If the policy is open, then, you know, it's open. Basically, there's no there's no limit anymore. So you can get much more. It doesn't matter if it's double or triple. There was one case I remember reading about where I think it was a $25,000 policy. And the attorney said, look, I'll settle the case for the $25,000. And then, um, you know, the insurance company said no, or they just didn't respond. And then the policy was deemed open. And then the verdict in that case t ended up being like over $100 million. And they had to pay it because it was open. So the defendants play a lot of dirty tricks and you just have to be careful with that. But it sounds, you know, it sounds like you have a good lawyer and the lawyer knows what's, you know, what to do. So that's a case you may have to go to trial on. And, you know, this was three weeks ago and he said it's going to trial in about a month. So maybe it's going to trial now or it will be soon. So update us. Let us know what's happening with this case. Okay. So let's see what other questions we have here. Circumnavigate says, this guy restores my faith in humanity. Oh, thank you so much. And then Amanda Lynn Gibson says, he's such an exceptional person, breaks the rules about how attorneys act. He teaches so much and is transparent about the injury lawsuit process. One of a kind, in my humble opinion. Oh, thank you so much. Wow, this is really great to hear. People are... Um, and somebody's co commenting on how to win your ceiling collapse lawsuit. Well, before I answer, was I under the ceiling? <laughs> I guess they're joking. I don't know. Yeah, you got to make sure you're, you were hit by the ceiling, obviously. Otherwise, it wouldn't be. If the ceiling didn't collapse on you, then you can't sue for a ceiling collapse. If the car didn't rear-end you, you can't sue for a, a car crash rear-end. Okay, let's see what other questions. Tomasa says, your videos are awesome. And then... Albert Einstein says, I was honest in my discovery and listed an injury over 15 years ago. I called my doctors I had at the time to get the records and they don't keep the records that far back. So how would the other side get the records if I can't? So yeah, I mean, probably they won't be able to either. You know, usually the doctors are required to keep the records for like, I think in, in, usually it's seven years, I believe. So if it's 15 years and you've already called the doctor's office, I mean, they can keep them for 15 years. They just don't have to legally. So a lot of them don't because it's just storage or whatever it is, whether it's digital, then it's going to take up hard drive space. If it's paperwork, it's going to take up actual physical space in their garage or their storage facility. So sometimes they do destroy them and they don't have them anymore after like a long time, like 15 years. So if you can't get them, then probably the defendants won't be able to get them. Basically, they don't exist. So then you don't have to worry about that. Okay, then USA007 says, great message to the video about diffuse axonal DAI, traumatic brain injuries. Thank you so much for that. Um, and then Ray says, can a brain injury make your stress bad? I never felt like this before. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things like post-traumatic stress disorder and brain injuries do affect your ability to you know, relax. They affect your basically your your ease and your wellness and they do make you stress one of the things brain injuries do is they you know they mess up your equilibrium they mess up your balance and they make you more irritable and then they give you, give you a quicker temper make you upset so definitely they can make you stressed so it's good to get checked out with a good doctor maybe like a neuropsychologist a neurologist you might need to do imaging uh, with a neuroradiologist so absolutely yeah, let me see here. Going through some of these questions. Some comments on our video about AI that's popular now, artificial intelligence. Um, and Araf says, I went on to chat GPT and asked it to write me a motion for summary judgment for my client that was rear-ended by a truck. It looked great. Although it looked perfect, I'm not an attorney, so I'm not sure how accurate that was. You should ask it the same thing and let me know what you think. Oh, yeah, maybe I'll check that out. I play with it a little bit, the chat GPT. I haven't really spent too much time on it, but yeah, it could be 
I, I think I've seen other lawyers start using it for a discovery. You know, when you ask for information, like requests for certain documents, and they might have certain templates or certain help with chat GPT or other artificial intelligence um, tools. So that's kind of interesting. Okay. see here, Casey Lemus. She writes, hello, I have a couple of questions. I'm a female, 25, with no prior symptoms or anything at all from California. I was in a car accident two years ago. A work truck ran a red light and struck my car. They took complete liability. And after going to urgent care, I found out I was pregnant and had to wait a year for treatment. Come to find out I have two herniated discs, one with significant four millimeter move. I've had three epidural injections, a laser percutaneous discectomy that did not work, and then went completely under for a lumbar decompression discectomy. I am now three, three weeks out and my surgeon is telling me I will need two spinal fusions in the future. And he's making sure to mark that in his notes. What's next for me after physical therapy? Can we close the case even though I have future surgeries and how will that be considered in my case? The policy is 1 million, but I feel initial to see to seeing how this has drastically affected my life what can i do or say about that yeah so i think like i mean you want to make sure that policy is only a million because they could have excess or umbrella depending on you know the circumstances so i would have your attorney really really vet that and double check and confirm you can get affidavits of no excess and you can also do a uh, search of the broker and get affidavits to make sure hey this is all we have. It's a million. We don't have anything more. Once you're convinced of that, then your attorney should negotiate and try to get that million, get it tendered. If you're really going to need these fusions, you know, it should be worth the full policy or very, very close to it. So yeah, the other way is if the policy gets open. So yeah, that's usually the way it works. But you know, in California, there are a lot of good lawyers. If you need any help, just text me. I have some good lawyers I could refer you to, but it sounds like it happened a few years ago. It sounds like you're already in good hands or you have somebody that you're working with. So definitely reach out to them. And then here's a question from a uh, Jayani page. How long after depositions do you hear from the lawyer? I mean, usually if it's your own lawyer, you should hear from them regularly, like maybe once a month, once every few months, you know, regularly. And if you reach out to them, they should be able to, respond to you with a text message, with a phone call, or with a, a meeting. Um, if it, if you're talking about the defense lawyer, the insurance company lawyer, in terms of giving you a settlement, then it could also be a few months later. Then now they have your deposition, they've examined it, they can give you an offer. Um, but, you know, it, it, there's no real set um, time period. It's not like after you have a deposition, they're, they're going to settle every case, right? They might just take your deposition and whatever, and just decide, look, we're not going to make an offer on this case. We're going to we're going to uh, take it to trial. Or it could be that they're waiting for your lawyer to reach out and for whatever reason, your lawyer hasn't reached out to them. So there's no set rule for, for cases to, um, you know, to resolve or to hear from a lawyer after a deposition. Okay, the next question, it's the trucker's fault. Oh, okay, they're commenting on the short where we talked about truck versus motorcycle, who was at fault. They felt the truck was at fault because they have to be aware of their surroundings. And uh, there was not likely a sign that said wide turns. Okay, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, tr they, you have to be careful. That, that happens a lot actually where, whether it's a truck or any vehicle, when you're making a turn or whether you're changing lanes, you have to make sure that that lane is open and safe to turn into. A lot of the times people will change lanes and there's already someone in there and then they'll clip the person or, or two people get into the lane at the same time, leads to a lot of accidents. Okay. And the Kitty Channel says, hey, I have a case pending in the Manhattan Federal Court for an accident I had with a semi-truck. My lawyer is handling it, but he hasn't shot me a number he thinks he could get from me, but he said he'll shoot for a million. Now my question is, when filing a lawsuit, does the amount sued for have to be included? I had neck surgery because of this accident. Yeah, well, I mean, usually not. You don't really have to put the amount in the lawsuit. It used to be many years ago, people would, 
lawyers would, and people would just put different numbers, right? One guy would put a million, somebody else would put 10 million. Somebody would be like, really, you know, think, hey, I wanna get in the newspaper, so I'll put a hundred million or I'll put a billion. And then it almost led to like a problem in that the insurance industry and the defendants would then say, look at all these greedy lawyers, they're suing for a billion dollars for this little, you know, my, my nail broke and they're suing for a billion dollars. So they started making fun of it. So then they said, look, you don't put the amount anymore, you just put for an amount that exceeds the jurisdictional limits of all lower courts. And what that means is that lower courts, right? Because in New York, you have the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court is the trial court. And so the Supreme Court has a jurisdictional limit of the site, like the, the, the baseline is like 50,000, right? And up, but there is no ceiling. So it could be like a billion, it could be anything, right? So it's just like, so it exceeds the jurisdictional limits of all the lower courts because the city civil court only is up to 50,000. It used to be up to 25. Now I think it's up to 50. So it's only up to that threshold. So you, if you file a case there, you're, you know that you can't get more than 50, right? It'll be $49,999.99 or whatever, but you can't get more than 50,000 because it just, it, 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 they don't have that jurisdictional ability. They can't give you more than that. That's all, that's what the court is for. Just like small claims court, I think is like 5,000 and under. Um, so it's just like each court has their own rules. Now in federal court, depends how you got there, but most cases that are accident cases, like truck accidents that end up in federal court, are there because of the diversity jurisdiction, which basically means that the two parties are from different states. So if that's why you're in federal court, then the amount in controversy has to be at least 75,000 or more. So, but yeah, usually you don't have to put the amount in the, uh, in the uh, lawsuit itself. It's just really, a lot of it depends on how much insurance they have, right? How much can you get from them? But yeah, when you go to federal court, you should be able to, to get more. Okay. And then the same person says they've had radio frequency ablation, four injections, ACDF surgery, um, that's anterior cervical discectomy infusion. What do you think it's worth? It was versus a truck and they admitted fault and I have a video and I'm recovering well. The upper limit is 7 million. Do you think my lawyer has a chance of getting the max? I mean, it's hard to say if you'll get like, you know, 7 million. I couldn't really tell you that in, in good conscience and good faith without like reviewing the file. But I mean, sure, it's possible. I mean, you could definitely get multi-millions. There was a verdict, I believe, like 9 million on a single level fusion. So depending how many, how bad the fusion was. But if you had all these procedures and it's a serious injury like that, you could get a multi-million dollar result. Now, also be mindful that if the case is in federal court, federal court tends to be much more conservative and harder to get bigger money than state court just because the way everything works, right? First of all, state court, say you're like in Brooklyn or the Bronx, you're only getting jurors from that county, okay? If you're in federal court, if you're in the Eastern District, you're getting jurors from all over, right? So they could be from Brooklyn, but they could also be from Suffolk County, right, which tends to be more conservative. If you're in the Southern District, I believe that covers Manhattan, but it also covers like Westchester. So you could be getting jurors. So it's a bigger juror pool. The other thing is that in federal court, you don't get to select a jury as an attorney completely. Like in state court, they, they give you some time limits, but they're very flexible. Like last time I had a trial, we were picking a jury for like four or five days. One time I had a serious fusion case, I was picking a jury for like two or three weeks, just picking a jury. Now this is state court. In federal court, the judge does a lot of the questioning and he doesn't even, he or she may not even allow attorney voir dire. Now you're really in trouble because I think jury selection is so important. The ability to speak with the jurors, the ability to connect with them, the ability to find who may be out for cause. And if you can't do that, right, then your hands are tied. Now you're just getting a jury. It's almost like, you know, just pick, uh, six people or, you know, a federal court, may, I don't do a lot of federal court cases, so I'm not, I, you know, federal court, it might be more, but you just pick, uh, you know, whatever it is, 10 people, 12 people, just pick the people. And now that's your jury. <laughs> Almost like you just go outside and find the first 10 people you, you find are going to be your jury. So it's not as good. So, you know, so, so if they give you a good settlement offer, you may want to consider it, of course, consult with your attorney, see what they think, but federal court is not the same. Uh, so it's a little tougher. Okay, and then N. Boykin Jr. says, good morning, I'm disabled and my husband who takes care of me was rear-ended by another driver who was totally at fault. He has gone through most of the things you described. And she's referring to the video, back injuries and your personal injury lawsuit, medical care and case compensation. 
Uh, the person that hit him did not have insurance. I'm glad that we had a rider for under, uninsured under insurance as well as income replacement. He was in his late 50s and I in my early 50s. He has been unable to work and care for me too. Do I have a remedy of pain and suffering? He hired a lawyer, but when I brought this up, his attention and he was like, you just would have to share in your husband's lawsuits. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, that sounds like if it's your husband, if you were married at the time of the crash, I mean, your husband has the lawsuit for the injury, right? Because that's a bodily injury. It's a personal injury, physical injury for your husband. But you as the wife can have what's known as a loss of consortium claim. So that's a derivative claim. It, it's, you know, derivative of the the main claim which is the injury claim but that could be a substantial claim so i would recommend maybe filing a loss of consortium claim it depends on the state each state has their own rules about that but in new york you could do that and i think those cases are actually really good a lot of lawyers we were actually just talking about this it's interesting on one of the uh, list serves yesterday i was reading a thread a lot of the lawyers maybe older lawyers were a little bit more like antiquated or set in their ways they think like oh loss of consortium is so bad because look when you get married, you talk about better or for worse, right? So, but then I was thinking about it. It's not really, yeah, it is for better or for worse. You know, when you say I do, when you get married, but you're not contemplating that someone else is going to choose to be negligent. Like for example, run a red light, crash into you and then ruin your marriage that way where they cripple your husband or your wife. And now you are forced to nurse and care for them, right? That, that's not the same as just like better or for worse. Somebody just gets sick because of genetics or because of, you know, whatever. Somebody just happens to get sick. This is like somebody else caused this, right? Somebody else was negligent. So that's why you're bringing a civil justice lawsuit against that person and making them pay for all the harms and losses. It's a little bit different. The other point is that, look, you have to, instead of disparaging the wife or the husband, the, consor the loss of consortium claim and saying like, oh, they have to stick it out for better, better or for worse. I almost think like the fact that they stayed, right? And the fact that they're still nursing and caring for this disabled person. If somebody's really hurt, they have like a fusion or they have a brain injury, they're a different person. But you're still, as the husband or wife, you're still staying with them. You're still caring for them. You're still nursing for them. And it's kind of like really ruined your quality of life because instead of having a partner that you married, that you're in love with, now you have somebody who's a cripple and you're forced to nurse and care for them. And you're forced almost like to be a 24 seven, you know, nurse or healthcare provider if it's a real serious injury. So that's, that's completely different. So I think that has to be compensated. And when you pick a jury in state court, you bring that up and you talk about the fact that you represent, you know, you only, you can have two, two, two different lawyers do it. You could have one lawyer represent the injured person and another lawyer represent the loss of consortium claim. And oftentimes when that lawyer gets up, who's representing loss of consortium claim, that lawyer can say, Hey, what do you think about the fact that the wife is, is, is entitled to compensation, you know, possibly millions and millions of dollars for the fact that she has to nurse and care for her husband who was so seriously injured. And then see what the jurors say. And a lot of the bad jurors are gonna say, I don't agree with that, I don't like it. I can't award or allow for, you know, millions of dollars for this. So good, get them off the jury. That's exactly how I did a video a few months ago about that $12 million soft tissue verdict in California, that's exactly how those guys got $12 million. They got 57 jurors off for cause on the loss of consortia because nobody could be fair, right? So it's good. And the only people left are the good jurors who could actually allow for money. Yeah, and the other, and the other thing you do is you just, you get up there and you say, the person who's representing the loss of consortium, that lawyer, it could be the same lawyer, but if it's a different lawyer, you get up there and you say, look, I'm the lawyer for the marriage. I represent the marriage. How has the marriage itself been affected. There's a lot of different tricks. I mean, I can't go into all of it, but that's a good question. And that's actually a very um, hot topic right now. And I think it's like shifting. I think it's changing. Because before people were like afraid of loss of consortium because they're worried about the defendants and all the defense, you know, tricks or whatever. But I don't really think that, um, that it's a problem. I, I, I like loss of consortium claims. And I think that the losses suffered by the marriage and, and, and plus like, you know, th this was, um, she, like she said, she was disabled and the husband who's now injured was taking care of her. So now she, she can't take care of him because she was already disabled before. So it just destroyed the marriage. That's exactly the point. So 
that, that, that could be a serious case. So I would definitely recommend uh, looking into that loss of consortium. Okay, let's see what other questions we have. Um, can you do a video on arthroscopic knee surgery and knee replacement cases? Yeah, absolutely. I'll do a video about that. That's a good topic. Grace C says, I'm very happy I found your channel. You are very informative. I like the way you take your time and speak slowly so we can understand every topic. Thanks again. I look forward to listening. And she's responding to the question, should I go to mediation, personal injury lawyers and settlements from trial stories? Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so glad that it's helpful and informative. I mean, that's what we strive to do. We strive to help people give out, you know, what our knowledge, answer your questions, basically give you value. Let's see what other questions we have here. How much do you think a four level ACDF neck surgery is worth due to electric shock on the job? Oh yeah, I think this person actually maybe reached out to me. I spoke with him and we exchanged that. I think I provided him with an attorney in his state that is giving him a consult. Yeah, that could be very serious. That could be worth multiple millions of dollars because, you know, a neck fusion is very serious at four level and absolutely. As long as the, you know, insurance is there, it could be a very significant case. And then Sinter Slave says, the process is so long. My injury occurred three years ago. My deposition was over a year ago. The note of issue date keeps getting extended. I'm guessing because as the conference note indicates, the defendant's depositions are still outstanding. The conference order says they were supposed to appear before November of 2021. It went to a conference in July of 22, and then again gets extended to December of 2022. The next conference is next week, February 21st of 2023. And the new noted note of issue date is March 7th of 2023. I still don't think my attorney has been able to do the deposition. How many extensions do judges give when the defendants doesn't have their people available for deposition? Okay, yeah, so that's a good question. Usually what you have to do is you have to be aggressive. Like if, you, you know, if it's court ordered and they don't appear, what I like to do is make a motion. And sometimes the judges will say, okay, you made a motion. So now the court order in response to the motion is produce the witness within 60 days. Now, if they don't produce, make another motion. You know, you have your template motion to just change it a little bit and you just keep filing them, you know? And then the second time they'll say, okay, now I'm gonna give you an order of preclusion. Produce your witness within 60 days. And if you don't produce them, they're precluded from testifying at trial, which means that if they're precluded, they cannot testify. Now, your version of how the crash or the incident happened is the only version because now you, the defendants are out. So. That's usually how you resolve that. And then it becomes a trial only on damages because now you've won liability because without a defendant to testify, they have no one to explain their version of, of how it happened. So, but yeah, I mean, I would say they usually give them like a few adjournments, like two or three adjournments, but definitely move to strike their answer and preclude them from testifying. And then you should get that court order. Let's see. Amanda Lynn Gibson says, you are one of a kind. I've been listening to this video tonight. I'm too overwhelmed to say more. Traumatic brain injury sucks. Big question. How does anyone know what attorney to hire? I hired the wrong one. Only obvious now in hindsight. Yeah, I read some of the emails from her. Yeah, it sounds like she was upset that the attorney kind of, you know, she feels like the attorney forced her or you know, got her to take a small amount, like a hundred thousand something, where it was a brain injury and potentially worth way, way more, millions and millions more. I mean, the important thing with traumatic brain injury is just that you feel comfortable with your attorney, that your attorney has experience with traumatic brain injury, that your attorney helps coordinate your medical care. You know, with traumatic brain injury, you really should be seeing doctors like neurologists, neuropsychologists, um, radiology, maybe testing, and really having that, that trilogy of doctors and as well as, you know, just getting all the care and the attorney has to work it up and the attorney has to uh, then put it on the trial calendar and not be afraid because it's, it's kind of like a new or, you know, a little bit new uh, area that some lawyers are not familiar with traumatic brain injury and some lawyers do not know 
how to handle it. And the defendants, some of these insurance companies devalue it. They think like, oh, it's traumatic brain injury. It's impossible to prove or, you know, it's not because of the brain injury. It's because you do drugs or it's because of you know, some other things because of, I don't know, your childhood or whatever, emotional distress. And then they just, they, they refuse to pay you a fair value. So you just have to go to court on it. So yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to know exactly, but you could definitely, you know, reach out to me. I'm happy to do a consult. I'm a member of the uh, traumatic brain injury attorneys group uh, from the American Association of Justice. So uh, I know some of the lawyers that specialize in traumatic brain injury all over the country. So I could recommend some good ones. Okay, let's do maybe one or two more questions because we're at the 35 minute mark. We don't want to make it too long. And then Reginald Williams, serious injury. Oh, here's a video I did. Serious injury, but pain and suffering was zero. That was a short I did. Yeah, that was a trial I did. That was a, a summary jury trial. It was a one day trial. And yeah, the client had, I think, $500 in damage to his bumper, like a little bit of a bent. Wasn't too serious, but he had all these injuries. And the jury ended up giving him $225,000 for his lost wages because he couldn't work. And so I guess he's asking what is considered little damage. I mean, usually little damage is something like that, like a few hundred dollars, something where if you look at the bumper, I mean, it was a little bit dented. It was like a little fender bender. It wasn't too bad. Usually if there is like bent metal or the metal is indented or crushed, then that's more serious damage. That could be a few thousand or even uh, several thousand. That's always better. But usually just common sense, you know, you, you look at what it costs to fix, you look at it uh, as to, you know, what it looks like to the human eye. And um, yeah, that's basically a little damage versus big damage. Let me see what other questions we have. Ray E says, sorry, I wasn't subscribed. I just did. I thought I was. That was weird. LOL. You are my best lawyer. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Ray. Yeah, Ray's one of our frequent commentators. He's always commenting and uh, giving some interesting comments and questions. That's good. And we appreciate um, everyone. Please like leave your questions. I'm going to do another live. Maybe we'll do it on YouTube. You can go on and you can like comment and then we could read your comments and answer them live. That's always good. But yeah, let me see what other, or maybe I'll do one or one or two more here. Mike Richards says, I love your videos because of your concern for injured people, your honesty and straightforward approach. I have a question that I have often heard from people in car accidents. If one vehicle hits another vehicle and the second vehicle that was hit drives into you, does it complicate the lawsuit even if you suffered extremely severe injuries such as a traumatic brain injury or, oh, oh, oh I'm sorry, aorta of the heart was damaged, ribs were bruised, a lung was collapsed, and a permanent nerve damage to one arm. In other words, does the vehicle that hit you have enough liability so its insurance must meet financial responsibility? Thank you, sir, for your hard work and integrity. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it really should complicate things because if one vehicle was at fault, that's probably the vehicle that's going to pay. If a vehicle was like, for example, a vehicle is just standing there, right? And like one vehicle hits another vehicle. And now this vehicle that's just parked, doesn't do anything wrong, just gets pushed into, let's say a pedestrian and the pedestrian gets hurt. The pedestrian could sue both vehicles, but in order to recover from this vehicle that was just parked, you'd have to show at least 1%, in New York at least, you'd have to show at least 1% negligence or fault on this vehicle that was just parked. If, it just, if it's just parked, it didn't do anything wrong. So you'd probably have to collect everything against the vehicle that pushed that vehicle into you, into the vehicle that was at fault. Um, but yeah, sometimes you can get some contribution. You know, that's, a, that's an example sometimes of a time where you should kind of settle because when these vehicles are in, early, they might be like, look, first of all, we have to pay, the insurance company has to pay the lawyers to defend this. Then the lawyers are going to bill the insurance company, you know, then who knows what's going to happen, right? What if the jury says they were 1% at fault? Now they're going to have to pay. So on top of paying the lawyers and paying, you know, for all of the processes, like the depositions and the trial, we're also going to have to actually pay the plaintiff you know, so sometimes those cases are good to settle when they're, they're really not at fault. That way you get something, a little bit of a security blanket for the client, and you go after the people who really were at fault. 
But that's a good question. Okay. Okay, now we're into about 12 days ago. Here's a question from a Kalis Parabat. Dear Arcady, love your videos and appreciate your information is awesome. I have a question. I was rear-ended by a mini truck. That mini truck was rear-ended by a bus. I felt I had one impact. The accident took place five or six years ago. I got treatment for three years and I had to go for surgery. I was rewarded from workers' comp for the third party case. I was just deposed. I am still with a lot of pain from aggravated bulging disc as well as two herniations, lumbar and cervical from this crash. I just saw my pain management doctor and he is a bit upset that I haven't seen him in a while due to the pandemic and suggested me to see the pain management doctor every two months for the rest of my life. The spine condition, the herniation, the pain is bad. The spine surgery might be needed if it becomes worse. Any suggestion, how long more will it take? Yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to say, you know, um, if, because I, I don't know where it's pending and you know, I don't know why it's taking so long or, so it's hard for me to say without reviewing the file. Uh, definitely a question you should ask your attorney, but if it was in New York and you were just deposed, you could still be a few years away because, you know, you still have to, like the other person in the earlier question, your attorney still has to depose the defendant, right? Now, once all depositions are done, all discovery paperwork has been requested and exchanged, now you can put the case on the trial calendar, but depending on what county you're in, in New York, you could still have to wait like a year or more to get to trial. So it's not like, you know, you're, you're, you you say, hey, I filed a note of issue, I'm ready for trial. You don't get the trial tomorrow. There's a wait of other people that are already on the line before you. So yeah, so it's, it could still be a, a ways away. But, you know, the other thing is, you could always try to settle the case or try to do a mediation. Okay, I hope that's helpful. And then Brenda Durham says, if the trucking company has paid for totaling my car without a fight, Will they pay for pain and suffering without a fight? No, I don't, I, you know, I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say so. I mean, paying for the, the car is one thing, right? Because say they hit you and, you know, they're at fault and they took fault and they said, look, the car is easy, right? Because it has a blue book value. You look it up and you say, okay, the car is worth whatever, 10,000, here's 10,000. But a human life is a little different, right? Because it's more like price versus value. A car has a price but a human life has value, right? Like say, for example, you can't pick up your kid anymore, or you can't throw your kid up in the air anymore because you just have that serious herniated disc and you might need to have a fusion. Well, the insurance company could say, yeah, we'll pay you, we'll pay you like $20,000. But to you, that value of not being able to pick up your baby, that could be worth millions. That could be, you know, priceless. And the insurance company just doesn't want to pay that value and they won't do it un un unless you kind of make them do it, unless you really aggressively litigate the case and put them in a settlement posture where they do pay you millions of dollars or you take them to trial. So, you know, you can't really expect the insurance company to be fair. Sometimes they are, you know, especially on the smaller cases or especially when there's a limited policy, but sometimes when there's a big policy and there's serious damage, like life-changing life forever injuries, that's when you have the real fight because that's when they don't want to pay. So I hope that's helpful. Okay, I guess that's good. And then next time we'll, we'll start with this question from Young's World. He's asking about a question about how much is my case worth or an estimate for a mild TBI? And he talks about an MRI and that's about uh, 12 days ago. So uh, maybe we could start with that question in the next last week tonight. Okay, and catch up. Or maybe we could discuss some of these questions in the live. If there aren't enough, you know, live comments from everyone, we could discuss some of these in the next live we do. But I'll mark this one as the where to continue. Okay, thank you everyone for watching. Thank you for subscribing to our channel. If you're not subscribed, please like and subscribe to our channel. Let us know what questions you have. If you have a question or you need advice, um, you need a consultation, just text me, 347-566-9595. I'll be, um, you know, probably calling people and trying to do um, consultations at least once or twice a week. And then, you know, just look forward to uh, continuing to make videos that help people. Let us know what topics you want to see and what you want us to discuss because we're here for you. Okay, have a great day and we will talk to you very soon. Bye-bye.